You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andy Tanner, and this is where we make investing simple. Uh, we congratulate you for tuning in. We always have great discussions, and this will be an interesting one. Uh, you know, traditionally, we often talk about things like uh, you know, the Fed rates and, you know, is the dollar going to be the U.S. Reserve, you know, reserve or the world's reserve currency and pretty heavy topics. And what's interesting is, is one of the things I've been asked to speak about lately, uh, and I've been invited to, to write in some books and some blogs and do some interviews, is uh, something you guys may or may not have heard about I've been doing with my kids. You know, when, when my older son, Zach, was uh, between the age of, uh, well, he just finished the eighth grade. And we had the option in the state where we live to do what we call a gap year. And what a gap year is, is you pull them out of school and you homeschool them and you can do it on any topic you want. So I, I pulled my son out of school, as some of you know, and it was one-on-one. I homeschooled him on stock investing, options trading, real estate investing, business development, and taxation. And those were the topics we studied because that's the stuff I know a little bit about. I don't know anything about physics and stuff like that. And I got to tell you, it was different than I thought it was going to be. It was one of the most bonding, precious, just imagine having a a, a entire year with your son every day, shadowing you in your business, learning to trade his own account, but really just the time together. And so people heard about this and I've been interviewed and, and asked about it. And it's kind of piqued my interest on something I, I, I want to share because what the question on people's minds is, is I want to do something like that for my kid. That's kind of out of the norm, but it sounds really fun. And, you know, that's a financial thing, but I'm going to tell you something about why I did it. And I'm going to use this to set up a really special guest um, that's been willing to come on you know, a financial show to talk something that's, that's as important as any dollar you could ever earn. Warren Buffett is certainly brilliant in terms of his education, but that often overshadows two other important attributes that have made him successful. Number one, in addition to his brilliance and and his knowledge in the market, he has a temperament that is extremely healthy in his approach to risk, in his patient approach, his, his ability to stick to things and discipline. And then he also found something he was passionate about. He didn't set a goal to become rich. He knew that when he was six years old, he was going to be an investor. He didn't say he was going to be rich. And now, you know, 30, at age 30, he could have quit. And now at age 90 plus, he gets up in the morning doing anything he wants to do. And he follows his passion. What he's always loved to do is go invest. And so as we teach our kids about money, I am often asked, about how to help prepare them with their financial wizardry. And my kids are not geniuses. They just applied their interest in a place most kids don't at that age. And it looks impressive, but it's not. But what I'd like to share with you today is I'd like to bring and introduce you to a very special guest, uh, Thomas Kirsting. And he's written a book that's much more broad than this on raising healthy teenagers Equipping Your Child to Navigate the Pitfalls and Dangers of Teen, of teen Life. His uh, website is uh, thomaskirsting.com. And the reason I've asked him to, to come and he's kind of come is I know that as important as that financial education was for my kids knowledge-wise, like Warren Buffett, giving them a temperament and helping them find a passion and self-discovery and, and lock into what they really want in life, whatever that might be, might not be stock investing, is so important. And part of the reason that I wanted to earn a lot of money in my life is so I could provide an opportunity to my kids, but I want to learn to do it the right way. So with that long introduction, thanks for your patience, Thomas. But I wanted people to get a sense of how important this topic is. And so, uh, Welcome to the program, uh, Thomas Kirsting, and thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me, Andy. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, to begin, just a little bit of your background, if you would, and why, uh, you know, what brought you to decide, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to write, write a little bit on, and help some of these parents out on, uh, on helping our teenagers develop uh, in all areas. 
Yeah, so so Andy, so I am my profession is I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I uh, have a private practice out here in New Jersey, been doing that for 23 years. I have two kids, an t- uh, almost 20-year-old sophomore at Clemson, majoring in chemical engineering, and then my uh, daughter Great. is a 16-year-old sophomore. Yeah, and, um, you know, and I, I, happen, I happen to know quite a bit about finances, too. I came from a family. You know, my parents had four kids by the time they were 25 years old. We had no money, but we had all the other goods. You know, I had wonderful parents, brought us to church every Sunday. So I learned uh, how to not do what my parents did financially because they were not good at it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I married a CPA, my wife. So, you know, we've always been really, really, you know, smart financially. So, you know, I think a, a, a good, you know, my book, Raising Healthy Teenagers, goes into everything kids are confronted with today, the mental health stuff, substance abuse, fear, anxiety. And I have a chapter about, you know, college and, and saving and, and all that goes with that as well. You know, from a uh... Uh, from whatever point a person wants to, to take it, whether it be a creationist standpoint or an evolutionary standpoint, whatever your, whatever your preference is, man alive, our bodies, you know, are, seem to be built to adapt to certain things, but the changes in technology and the things our brains are experiencing, particularly young developmental brains, man, it's got to be off the chart for these guys. I mean, it's got to be... Uh, the dopamine hits that come in ways that are different from, you know, catching a fish, <laughs> you know, or something. Uh, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you the truth. I am a, I'm, I guess it's normal for every generation to have a little anxiety about, Oh boy, this world, my kids are growing up in, you know, but I got it. And I guess every generation feels it's unique, but I got to tell you the exponential nature of the hockey stick of, of technological development and AI and stuff is it, am I off in saying that this is a little different for my kid than any other generation by orders of magnitude? Is, is that just a perception? Am I paranoid? Am I a paranoid dad or, or is there some legitimacy, legitimacy to my concern? Well, no, that's, that's an absolute reality. I, I actually discussed that in Raising Healthy Teenagers. I talk about, I remember when I was a kid, my mother would say, oh my God, I wish you guys could have lived in the 1960s, right? And I tell my kids, I wish you guys could have lived in the 1980s because yeah. we had nothing but freedom, riding our bikes around and so forth. Kids today, my previous book, Disconnected, came out a couple of years ago and it goes real deep into technology. I'm one of the pioneers in the space of screen time and mental health. I've been lecturing on that all over the country since 09. And, um, you know, kids today, here's the issue, right? So we want our kids to be happy. We want them to be successful. We want them to acquire wealth, right? Um, have a good career and so forth. And that requires knowing self, right? Let me explain what I mean by that, all right? The average kid nowadays spends between nine and 10 hours per day hypnotized, right? On some other planet, mm-hmm. the cyber world, right? All right. So they're not really here. And, and, and essentially they don't know who they are. Like you have to be here, you have to be present in order to know who you are. And when you know who you are, that is what ignites, you know, the motivation within you, the confidence within you to go after what you want to go after in life. Hmm. So essentially, you know, our, our own children and even adults, we are, because of the modern tech world we live in, we are essentially distracted from self. Hmm. Think about that. Think yeah. about that. No, for sure. I, I, uh, you know, when, it, when you talk about hypnosis and I think about the concept of trance, you know, I think about a, a, a hyper concentration, a, a state of, of focus and in, 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 you know, kind of enraptured in an idea to where, you know, time doesn't pass and we almost become, uh, our critical factors are set aside and we simply accept information non-critically and begin to connect neural pathways in our brains um, very, very readily without a lot of critical thought. Is that close to what's happening uh, when they're in these trances of like, you know, there's a ton of video game and uh, scroll. I mean, there's a lot of technology they're, they're spending a lot of time with. Is that close? Well, you're right on, right? So, um, you know, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the uh, 19th century German philosopher, had a quote that goes like this. We are under the presumption that we are thinking, but in reality, we are being thought. Mm-hmm. And what he means by that, it's kind of a play on words, being thought, what he means by that is that we are being controlled by thought yeah. rather, than, rather than being in control of thought. 
Yeah, being present has been a big deal um, in in my personal development. And the reason I, I bring, you know, I, I love your insight and I love these types of books because when a person decides to become an investor, an entrepreneur, they're really engaging in an exercise in personal development. And that's especially true for young people. Uh, you know, actually becoming wealthy, if you would like your kids to become wealthy, the, the financial education I give is less valuable to them simply because of how compounding works. Let, let me kind of explain this and, and see if you have thoughts on it for, for kids. Because when people come to me and they say, Andy, I just think it's amazing what you've done with your kids. They're out there investing and they're making money. And they, you know, they ended, I, I, I did a workshop in Houston with a bunch of investors and you know, my, my 50 year old kids up on stage and he's, he looks smarter than he is. I mean, he's, he's normal kid. He's picking out deltas and picking out strikes and, you know, he's doing credit spreads and, you know, all this fancy stuff that makes him look like a savant, but any kid could really do it. But here's the thing people don't get because I started my kids compounding, you know, journey about age 12. When you apply the compounding formula to them, if they're consistent, they don't need any fancy investments. They just need consistency and 45 years. The problem the guy that's 55 has is he's got 10 years. And I can put my sons in, I can put that guy in the same, in, in, I can put my sons in a conservative investment. When they're done, they'll have about, you no know, 10, $15 million. This guy will have, you know, 20 grand because <laughs> he doesn't have the time. So when you teach your children about money, it's really easy to ha give them a vision of self-sufficiency and security and wealth because the secret to them doing it isn't really sophisticated investing knowledge. It's discipline, it's consistency, it's delayed gratification, right? It's habits. It's the personal development of playing the piano or making lots of foul shots it's the same awareness and presence and, and goal setting and sticking to it that's 99% of it for a teenager to become wealthy. Any comments on that personal development piece? Yeah, 100%. So, you know, teenagers, you know, middle school is high school, right? They're very impressionable. Um, and they live in this, you know, comparison culture, right? They yes. See what everybody else has. Oh my forth. gosh. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think another important thing for that we need to teach kids in terms of acquiring wealth is don't, is don't keep the, don't keep up with the Joneses. Like, you know, you mentioned Warren Buffett earlier. I read once that Warren Buffett drives a Toyota. Okay. You know, you can get a Toyota for 20 something thousand dollars, <laughs> 250,000 miles out of it. Right. So that's the kind of stuff I teach my kids. Like if you want this car, whatever, you know, they're not like that. Right. So, you know, we need to teach them that if they're spending their own money, do you really need a pair of Jordans that are $300? You know, it's about, you know, really looking at things, looking at society, right? And as, you know, Robert Kiyosaki said, you know, the amount of toys in your driveway uh, is, is not an indication of wealth. It's an indication of debt. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so wealth is the amount of zeros you have in your bank account, right? And that's what I teach my kids. It's the amount of zeros you have in your bank account. It's not the amount of stuff you have, the fancy clothes, you know, the fancy this and that, those are, those are liabilities. Those are not rateables. Those are not things that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to grow from like you're teaching your kids, you know, start investing now and that compound growth over the next 40 years, you're going to be sitting on 10 or $15 million instead of a pile of junk that's worthless. You know, you, you mentioned Robert Kiyosaki. My, my kids have been so lucky. Um, you know, Robert inv in, invited my kids at a very young age. Uh, I think the first time he put my son, David on stage, he was nine years old in Argentina when everyone had translation with headphones, and he had him diagram a real estate uh, deal that wound up being achieving an infinite return, and it, it just brought the house down. I think those experiences, if if you can give them, are great. But but here's another angle to why uh, raising healthy kids is huge, and this is maybe a little bit paranoid. I look at the Federal Reserve. And what most people worry about is inflation and, you know, where we could go fiscally. We're on a pretty rough path. Uh, most of the reports I read, you know, say, hey, this is unsustainable. Uh, government's really broken right now. And the U.S. dollar is going to lose its uh, position in the world's reserve currency. We have crypto. We have privacy going away. We, ha we are set up for some very tumultuous financial times. 
Uh, we, we are going to have AI involved in trading. We're going to have DeFi. All these changes are going to happen so fast that kids are, that are hypnotized and not prepared to adapt to difficult times. I think, you know, a Great Depression in 1929 is buffered by the fact that almost everyone had a garden and everyone went out and dug potatoes and, you know, you could eat and so forth. Today, it's not like that. And I just think that the challenges that our kids are going to face in the in the world of business, technology, and changes, and government, and you look at the divisiveness and the canceling of of not celebrities that have a poopa, but there's almost people that lie in wait with a gotcha mentality on a hair trigger of saying, "Aha! He stepped in it. He screwed up. Cancelled." And this can be a teenager. So resilience. And, and, you know, like you said in your book, equipping your child to navigate pitfalls and dangers of teen, teen life. <laughs> what a subtitle, right? Not just healthy, but resilient and tough and where words can't hurt me and, and, and having a sense of self-pride. Uh, it's a huge, huge deal. What do you think the most important takeaway or what's the nugget in raising healthy teenagers in that book uh, that's going to help people feel good about having a pathway or, or some tools for their kids? Well, you know, in, in line of what you just mentioned right there, right? So our society, politically, the media, everything else, right, is, is literally teaching our kids to be victims. Right? Yeah, and yeah. It, 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 they're teaching victim mentality, right? So what I, you know, through, through the whole messaging of the book, I, I mean, there's so much in here, we wouldn't even have enough time to really scratch the surface. For sure. But I guess the, over, the overarching theme is that we want to teach our kids how to be leaders, okay? A leader no words can affect a leader. Like when mm-hmm. you hear about like the term yeah. anti-bullying, you know, anti-bullying, that in New Jersey, yeah. they this anti-bullying legislation, right? Right. Mother Teresa said, Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, invite me to an anti-war rally and I'll never attend. Invite me to a pro-peace rally and I'll be there. So if, we, if we're, when we're teaching our kids leadership, right, we're teaching them confidence, confidence yeah. in who they are. Not following the crowd, not, not being, you know, uh, victimized by this whole, you know, victim mentality. And what happens then is you, you become insulated from bullies or cancel culture people because they can't affect you. A person that is confident, a person that is a leader, is incapable of being bullied. Because they'll put it right back at the person. You know, I couldn't agree more. Um, we have a we have an interesting tradition that we started when my kids were very young called Family Night, and we do it on Monday. And what's different is I have the kids teach it. In other words, we'd get together, you know, they're five and, you know, seven years old. And I'd say, okay, who wants to be in charge? And maybe David says, I do. And I says, all right, what song do you want to sing as a family? And I'll take me out to the ball game. Okay, great. And do you have anything you'd like to share? Any lessons of wisdom? And they might say, well, I want to talk about sharing. And by letting them be the teachers, it really helped them, you know, organize what they felt was important to them or the way they wanted to share. And what I found is if I said it, well, it may be true, and that's dad's advice, but boy, if they taught it and said it, they owned it and they believed it, right? They had a, a, an ingrained in them. And so we, we did this, you know, years and years. It's become more sophisticated. And usually it's just about two, four, five, six minutes long. And then, you know, we go eat ice cream. If they didn't want to do it one week, we wouldn't force them to do it. But those family traditions were, were really, really powerful in having uh, a sense of family and a sense of leadership. And, and in one of our family home evenings recently, uh, one of our family nights, I said to them, I said, I'm going to share, I, I, I'd like to share a, a little something about victimhood. Um, we're all victims of something and that's okay. Every person can find a slight, you know, mom's been doing cancer treatments. That doesn't seem very fair, does it? You know, all these things have been going on in our lives. And I said, I'm going to tell you guys something that I believe is true. And I I wish I could have figured out how to have them teach it to themselves or them teach it to me. But I said, son, there is no government program externally that has the horsepower to compensate for a poor, you know, personal policy in your life. And on the other side of that, there is, there is no bad government program that can destroy the horsepower 
of your own personal policy. In other words, it takes a long time for systemic change. And we do, like I like, pro, I, I like being a progressive in that we need to progress. And there's really bad ideas, you know, a hundred years ago that we really do need to jettison today. You know, bloodletting in, in uh, medicine is a bad idea. We got to jettison that and, you know, learn about antibiotics or whatever. And that's true with cultures too. But at the same time, if you've been a victim of a cultural wrong in your view, it's glacially slow to get to march and, you know, march and complain and, uh, and you can do all those things and for whatever you care about, go ahead and do it. But don't forget your personal power to build your own life despite any slights that you've been given. And that resiliency is is what I hope to to get in to get in my kids. You mentioned that we're we're messing around with uh, so much technology. You know, there's a lot of dopamine hits, a lot of loops that are quite frankly addictive. Is that reversible? And if so, how do we reverse? If you feel like your kid just can't, I, I always tell people, here's a test: have one kid hold their breath, have the other kid not text. See who lasts longest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If my right. kid can't set down a phone or has a problem with this, what would you say is, you know, about the, the, the reversing? Is it neuroplasticity? Is it chemical? Is it psychological? What is it? So I'm going to get, I'm going to answer uh, the first part of your dialogue just now, right? So about family and so forth, family night, right? And then I'm going to get to that. So when I'm lecturing, I lecture all over the country. I, when I'm speaking to parents and so forth, I explain that the, the, a typical family, let's take a family of four, if you look in the dictionary, right, uh, the, the, the definition of a family is kind of like the Brady Bunch, right? Nowadays, a family of four is like four individuals that, that happen to live under the same roof but are, but are in their own room doing their own thing. Oh, right? boy. On their own screen, right? So there's no, there's, no conne- there's no family connection and dialogue anymore. Right. And that's because kids, when they're in middle school and high school, are literally spending all of their time in their bedrooms by themselves. And the parents are doing the same thing. So there's no connection. And for the, the overall success, mental, uh, career success, financial success, the most important thing to make sure that, to ensure that our, our kids develop that is the relationship they have with their parents. And a relationship is founded on sitting down together, oh, communicating, and so forth. Now, the second part of your question, the dopamine, I talk about this in the book, right? So why are the kids in the bedroom, okay? So all of these apps, video games, social media apps, they are intentionally designed to target the pleasure-seeking part of the brain that produces dopamine. Dopamine is the feel-good chemical, right? It's when you you hit the home run, you get a rush of dopamine, right? Now, our kids are marinating in dopamine all day long, and they don't even know it, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't help themselves. They're addicted. Every every, every form of addiction is associated with with an overload of dopamine. And -hmm. it's called homeostasis. Through evolution, so to answer your question, how do we get back? It's called homeostasis. Through Mm -hmm. evolution, the brain has an ability to create a balance so that you don't have too much dopamine or too little. But once the scale gets tipped, which is precisely what's happening right now, and you have an, an overload of dopamine, you have the addictive nature of it, but then you have the crash the crash. Mom or dad comes and takes the phone or video game system away. What's the ensuing result? An absolute withdrawal and crash that manifests itself in a form of a behavioral, emotional, and often physical outburst. Wow. And those are, those are not, those qualities are lack thereof, or, or, or lack thereof that our kids are demonstrating, this oppositional behavior I'm seeing a ton of, is, is the polar opposite of what you need in order to be happy and successful in life. Wow. It's, it is such a challenge for sure. We're speaking with Thomas Kirsting. His book is Raising Healthy Teenagers, Equipping Your Child to Navigate the Pitfalls and Dangers of Teen Life. I, I, hope, that, uh, I hope that along the way uh, that people can uh, find that joy in parenthood anymore. You know, my, my friend Robert Kiyosaki, he bashes uh, school teachers. You know, they don't teach in education and financial education. But I'll tell you, I, I'm kind of on the warpath on, on parents. There's some bad parents out there. I hope I'm not one of them. Uh, but I'll tell you, since when is it the school's job to prepare my son for success. I mean, what, 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 what you want to farm that out to a school teacher? Look, let him teach him how to read a little bit and maybe do some math, but teaching about life and, and, and toughness and, 
you know, the things that really matter. That's kind of my job, and I don't want to give that up to somebody else. So I recommend, you know, doing active research and educating yourself on anything you want to do. And if you want to be, you know, financially free, study with me on finance. But why are we doing this? Well, part of wealth building is legacy. And the legacy is not to leave my kids as stewards of my assets. My legacy is to give my kids stewards so they become stewards, so they are stewards. It's actually their abilities and their temperament to to handle wealth that is more important than the wealth itself. It's never been more important to love our children and to realize the dangers that they live in a different world than we did. And we got to do everything we can with desperation, right? To do everything we can to learn about how their brains work, uh, learn from people who understand psychology uh, like Thomas and, uh, and pick up raising healthy teenagers and learn the science uh, behind what's happening with our kids. Any final uh, advice is, you know, we're, we're coming up at the end of our time. If you're, if, you know, I've got some friends that, you know, I don't know why my, I think there's a little bit of luck involved. I think there is nature to certain kids. You know, I was a really rough kid to raise. I think my poor parents just, I don't, I I think they're surprised I never went to prison or something. I just was a weird kid for whatever reason. People say, Andy, why are your kids doing so well? I go one word, Marcy. It's my wife. (laughs) That's it. But I tell you, my heart goes out. I've got some dear friends with some with some teenagers that are just giving them freaking fits, man. I mean, obstinance, rebelliousness, disobedience, power struggles. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't think you can you know encapsulate that. Uh, like you say, your book's lengthy, but could you give them a start? Could you say, look, here's where you start when you when you've lost your kid. And he or she is just completely obstinate, hates you. Is there a starting point that might give some common ground or a place to start for my friends like that? Starts at birth. <laughs> yeah. but, to your, but, to your, but to your point, right? So, you know, we, we want our kids to be successful, right? Who doesn't want their kids to be more successful than us, right? And success comes, you know, we, we define that in terms of, you know, our careers and our wealth and so forth. But what, what I want people to understand is that, Money and wealth doesn't create happiness. Happiness creates money and wealth. Mm. So the relationship you have with your child, getting them out of that bedroom and build, the, the most important thing is the relationship with parents, believe it or not, for a kid's success. So we have to be there. We have to raise our kids. We can't let uh, technology raise them. We have to let them, we have to listen to them, like you mentioned earlier. And we have to really help mold them into happy, confident, motivated beings. Because that is the that's the recipe right there that's gonna that's gonna facilitate the future success. Mm. Now, if a parent has a kid that's already rebellious and so forth, you got a teenager. You know, it's gonna be some tough love. That's the bottom line. You know, mm. you, we parents need to understand that our kids need to understand that you know we are the ones in charge, not them. Okay. Mm. You know, like my father used to say to us. You know, when we when we'd say, "Oh, you don't trust me," he would say, "God didn't give you to me for me to trust you. He gave you to me for you to trust me." And, and, and that's what parenting is founded on right there. And, um, you know, we want our kids to be successful. We have to be there. We got to turn off our, our computers ourselves. We got to get our kids out of the bedroom if they're misbehaving or they're addicted to, this, you know, to these devices and stuff. We got to get them out of the, We got to get them out of the fold. And there's going to be even more rebellion. But the turnaround will, will take about 30 days. You know, I've tried to do it by trading the dopamine out because you can get dopamine hits other places and you can get oxytocin. Uh, with a good hug and you know stuff like that and you can get other chemicals going and i'll tell you it's it's kind of fun to sit out you know and and have a koi pond and look at stuff like that and have activities that they really enjoy and uh it isn't like hey turn your cell phone off you know it's like if i can provide an alternative experience that's different than that that helps with the identity and gives them the good feeling you know when i teach investing I have three rules I follow, fun, simple, real. Uh, And what happens is when education becomes enjoyable, uh, they embrace the experience. 
So I try as best I can to think about what can we do to just really have fun as a family and just maximize fun. There's times to be serious, but boy, you know, you can, you can beat the phone with some good old fashioned fun. So Thomas, thank you so much for spending time with us. Again, the website, www.tomkirsting.com. Book is uh, Raising Healthy Teenagers, Equipping Your Child to Navigate the Pitfalls and the Dangers of Teen Life. And in 2023, boy, what a battle we've got in front of us. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. And uh, on the Cashflow Academy, we'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.